War is coming. New Yorkers watch the harbor with apprehension. I'm sitting in the outhouse, which has a good view of the harbor. I get my discharge, and then I look out the window. Well, I can't believe my eyes. It's like a, a forest of pine trees are moving in out there. In 10 minutes, the whole bay is full of ships. It looks like all London has floated here. 30,000 troops, 10,000 sailors, 300 supply ships, 30 battleships with 1,200 cannon. It is the largest seaborne attack ever attempted by England until the 20th century. A whole host of emotions must have gone through Americans, wondering, did they have the stuff to take on the largest army, the largest empire in the world? And seeing this huge force, realizing that the British were not going to let this empire go without a big fight, it must have been a terrifying and frightening moment in July of 1776. News of the Declaration of Independence reaches Ambrose Searle, secretary to Admiral Howe of the British Navy. We are presently at anchor in full view of New York and the rebel headquarters under Washington. We heard that Congress has announced that the colonies are to be independent states. The madness of these deluded people. As far as the British were concerned, there was both an emotional and a practical response to American independence. The emotional response is how dare they? How dare they? You know, that the British had fought to clear the French out of North America, that these people were subjects of the British crown, that this was totally unacceptable. King George is determined to restore British sovereignty to the colonies. But he is reluctant to wage an all-out war. War was a war against foreigners. War is real war. War is a war against national enemies. But the Americans weren't foreigners. They were Englishmen, Scotsmen, they were the king's subjects, deluded perhaps, misguided, troublesome, turbulent, inconvenient, but not foreigners, not an enemy, not people you could or should think in terms of fighting a war against. The British forces are led by two brothers. Viscount Richard Howe heads the navy. Sir William Howe leads the army. They plan a demonstration of British naval power fully confident that this will force the rebels to the bargaining table. July 12, 1776. Admiral Howe orders two of his frigates, the Phoenix and the Rose, to sail up the Hudson, guns blazing. The roar of the cannon is so terrible that many in our army and navy have never heard anything like it before. Apparently, the rebels were frightened by the din. The whole scene is awful, grand, I might even say beautiful, except for the sad fact that people's lives are at stake, even if they are the lowest of criminals. After this show of force, the Howes send out peace feelers to General Washington. Surely now he will be willing to negotiate. They meet at Colonel Henry Knox's headquarters on Broadway. Under a flag of truce, General Washington met with no less than the Adjutant General of Howe's army. He informed our commander that Lord Howe had come to New York with great powers to pardon those in rebellion. General Washington told him that he had come to the wrong place. The Americans had not offended, therefore they needed no pardon. This confused the Adjutant. Has Your Excellency no particular message which you would honor me to convey to Lord and General Howe? Nothing, sir, but my compliments to them both, replied Washington, upon which he bowed, and they parted on the most genteel terms imaginable. The message is clear. The Americans will not back down. This means war a war which will begin here in New York City. New York was virtually indefensible for the Americans. It was an island. We didn't have a navy. The British had a navy. It was one of the most difficult locales. 
for Washington to even conceive of defending. I think he would have preferred not to have tried, but the Continental Congress felt that some show had to be made, and he agreed. The British must wait two months for all their ships and supplies to arrive. Meanwhile, they stage on Staten Island. In the sweltering New York summer, the soldiers train. Led by officers in heavy wool coats and wigs, they parade in full battle dress. They write home about the heat, the ferocious mosquitoes, and the American women. The fair nymphs on Staten Island are fresh meat for our men. A girl cannot step into the bushes to pick a rose without risk of being ravaged. We have the most entertaining court martials every day. The British are joined by 8,000 German troops, known as Hessians. With a reputation for being savage fighters, these soldiers are rented from German princes for seven pounds a head. The British forces are among the biggest, best trained, and toughest armies in the world. They believe Washington's troops will present no serious opposition. But a lot of the generals had been to America because they had been fighting in there in the Seven Years' War, in the French and Indian War, and their opinion of colonial troops was on the whole pretty low. They didn't think much of colonial troops, and, you know, who were the senior officers of the colonial militia? Men like Major Washington, who'd surrendered the moment he'd met the French the first time. This was the kind of thing which didn't inspire confidence uh, among experienced professional soldiers and they tended to take the view that colonial troops were all very well as long as you kept them out of the way of the enemy. The men who joined the American army could not be more different from the hardened career soldiers of the British army. The Americans come with a variety of motives. Some are patriotic. Some are just in search of adventure. A typical soldier is Joseph Plum Martin, a young farmer from Connecticut. In a diary which he will keep for the seven years of the war, he records the day of his enlistment. Last year when I saw my friends marching off, I went home, bit my fingernails, imagining them all telling me of their exploits, swaggering home, their hairbreadth escapes. So I took up a pen made my mark and joined. Now they make you sign up for a whole year. I was just hoping to get a priming before I took on the whole coat of paint of a soldier. The soldiers come from all over. The sovereign state of Maryland, the plantations of Virginia, and the wilderness of New Hampshire. Many young men have never been away from home they are meeting people from other states for the first time in their lives. You know, they put me in this regiment, half New Englanders and half Pennsylvanians. There's folks as different as night and day. I mean, myself, I'd rather be fighting with a tribe of Indians than with these Southerners. I mean, the foreigners can hardly speak English. They don't like me either. I mean, they call me that damn Yankee. That's about the nicest thing they say. One has to remember that in 1776, Americans are not in any way one nation yet. And in fact, most people would have thought of their, uh, of their nation, if they talked in those terms, or of their country, as Virginia or Connecticut or Massachusetts, and their loyalties were to their province which had, each of them had its own long history. And I think that was a question that a lot of people wondered in 1776 about the term American. Just how American are they? And whether they weren't Virginians and Massachusetts and Connecticut people first. The general has heard that jealousies have arisen among the troops from the different provinces. Name calling, which causes irritation and can only serve to hurt the noble cause in which we are all engaged. The provinces are all united to oppose a common enemy. All distinctions must be sunk in the name American. 
George Washington. Washington's goal is to forge a united and professional army. He is fiercely determined that the British see him as a general worthy of the name. In 18th century terms, that also means being a proper gentleman. There's no character in the revolution who is so obsessed with doing what was proper, what, was, what the best uh, people thought was the right thing to do. One of his first books that he owned was, uh, and that he copied out uh, assiduously at the age of 16 were uh, rules of, of etiquette from a courtesy manual. Washington is a man of, of intense uh, self-will, very quick to anger, but he controlled it. Almost his whole career is an act of, of will. The reason he behaved the way he did, in sometimes in a wooden-like fashion, was because he was trying to live up to what he saw was the ideal classical image of a hero. Of course, the, the great part of the problem was that the, the British had not treated the American officers like gentlemen before the war, when they uh, had been mere provincial officers. And it's often said that if only the British had made George Washington a regular colonel in the armed forces of the Crown, uh, he, he w wouldn't have been a revolutionary at all. Indeed, might have been fighting energetically to put the rebellion down. One observer is Nicholas Cresswell, an English traveler. I met Washington, you know. Before the war, I visited him at Mount Vernon. He's an honest man, no vices, except, of course, ambition. He's not well educated, he doesn't speak very well, but there is something about him that makes people close to him very loyal. Look at how he's managed to hold together all those stubborn, headstrong groups he's had to work with. August 21st. An American spy reports to Washington that Lower Long Island, what is now Brooklyn, will be the first target of the British. Washington rushes in reinforcements. We immediately start fortifying our positions. Fear is a great inspiration for hard work. I have my gun, canteen, knapsack, and a blanket. My first battle. Will I be able to kill someone else? The next morning, under cover of the formidable guns of the British Navy, 15,000 British troops land unopposed at the southern tip of Long Island. Waiting behind defensive barricades three miles away are the Americans. They are outnumbered two to one. The British regiments, in dense formation, march up the open fields toward the heights. Their plan? To crush the rebellion in one decisive battle. The British advance to within about 300 yards of us and begin a very heavy fire. Bullets and shells fly very fast, now and then taking off a head. It's very, very difficult to reconstruct these extraordinary battles of the past. But they did indeed form up in dense ranks, very carefully ordered. They did march up to within musket shot of each other with the officers in front and they did fire at each other at very close range indeed. A man firing at another a hundred yards away had almost no chance of hitting him. The ball might go anywhere. So the only way you could in, in, be certain of inflicting casualties on the enemy was to mass your men as closely as possible together. So both sides formed up into compact clumps and fired at each other, each hoping that the other would run away. Once you would have loaded for the first volley, fired your first volley, returned your musket and reloaded, the noise was such that there was no hearing anything. You couldn't hear commands. 
you'd be very lucky if you could hear a drum beat, for instance, which was one of the reasons they used drums for various commands once the volleying started. But it was then fire at will, and you just kept firing until you heard either a drum beat or somebody yelling in your ear, cease fire, cease fire. There was no organization after about the third volley. The Patriots hold the high ground. They shoot down on the advancing enemy soldiers. The British realize that they must change tactics or suffer heavy casualties. Howe was a professional when he came over with his troops. He immediately uh, sent out his light dragoons to scout the territory. He also had some local Tories that were guiding him, and they found out that the passway over on uh, the uh, American left was virtually unguarded. The Americans, not know any topography, they just slipped up and they left the Jamaica Pass unguarded. With half their forces in the front, keeping the Americans occupied, a division of 10,000 British soldiers marches undetected through the Jamaica Pass to a position behind the American lines. Our men stand amazingly well until 12 o'clock when the main party of British, by a route we never dreamt of, surround us. Suddenly they looked around and here was Howe's army coming up behind them. Here was Howe's army coming up on the side. They had to control the line. Which way could they fire? They simply broke and they ran. The Americans have only one escape route, through the Gowanus Marsh. The British slaughter the fleeing soldiers. I can't describe the confusion and the horror of the scene. Artillery flying, our men running in every direction, and everywhere we turn, we meet the British or the Hessians. Men up to their knees in mud, screaming for help. Everyone else running to save their own skins. It was a catastrophe. And partly it's American amateurism at uh, fighting this kind of big battle. They'd never fought a battle on that scale before. They'd never had an organization that was designed to fight that kind of battle before. This is new, and they got clobbered. The rebels have courage, but British discipline wins the day. Their raw troops never seen action before. Their officers have no understanding of the strategies of war. The Maryland soldiers were from the best families in the province. They were heroes, cut down in the bloom of their youth. The pursuit and slaughter lasted for many hours. At that moment in late August of 1776, it really looks as if you're going to lose the war in the first battle, just as the British commanders had predicted you would. British planning is based on the idea of one big decisive battle, and this looks like it, the Battle of Long Island. The Americans have retreated to Brooklyn Heights. Facing them is the British Army. At their backs is the East River. Almost the entire Continental Army is trapped. The British wait for Washington to surrender. In the 18th century, in, in uh, European warfare, it wasn't just a question of winning, but it was also a question of how you won. In a way, it was better to lose well than to win badly. That was they, they, they thought the form and ritual of warfare was very important and, uh, and wished to behave uh, like gentlemen at all times. According to the gentlemanly rules of warfare, Washington should concede defeat. Instead, when night falls and a thick fog blankets the East River, he orders his troops to keep all their campfires burning. Then, quietly, he begins to ferry men, horses, and cannon back to Manhattan, a few boatloads at a time. By morning, the entire American army has crossed over to New York. 
and the British finally discovered that the fortifications were no longer occupied, they rushed through down to the bank just as the last boat was pulling away. And the last man in the last boat was George Washington. 